Right. Thank you, Christian. Okay, hit it. Hello, welcome everybody, and thank you for this invitation to to share some things about the Sky Guide with you. Um, it's a it's a bit of a dry topic, really, because uh, apparently it will be some kind of overview of history. So let's dive into it. And I thought one way of approaching that is to show you what what these previous publications look like, so we can see over its almost eighty years um, how things have evolved. Um, what you see on the screen is the first. Um, is the first of three numbers, volume or edition numbers one, two, and three. We okay, are... you need to share your screen. Sorry? You need to share your screen. Uh, can't you just use my my video feed? So uh, uh, just click you just click on his on his screen, his video feed. Can't you just use my video feed? Uh, make my picture bigger? Yeah, if, you, if you double click on him or do speak of you, you should be able to see him. Yeah, or, or click the three the three dots and say pin. That pin, worked yeah. for me. Um, can everybody see that? We can see it also. Okay. Good, we're all good to go. Good to go. Great. So I thought I, I thought I'll, I'll, I will do a quick um, a visual guide to show you what what how the handbook looked over time. We are now um, at number seventy eight. This is number three in the series. And through, if you if we review or as we review these editions, you'll see a number of themes popping up. Um, the one is that is the role that technology has played in enabling the production of this. Um, that feeds into the number of people who are involved. And the other theme we'll pick up is the content. What does one put in a, a guide like this? How is this different from just an ephemeris that somebody will calculate? Um, who the target audience is? So I've identified, let's say, five challenges that, that one has to look at when making something like this. First one is production. Then there's the distribution of the item. Then there's a the question of your varied audience. Who are you creating this for? Then there's how to make it authentically South African, because it is a South African book about South African conditions or Southern African. And then appeal. How do you make how do you make it so that it appeals to the largest number of people, um, including your primary audience, which I think is is ASA members. So if we look at how they did it originally, um, this is what the first three looked like. We had there were some star charts. This is 1948, by the way. Um, there were some lovely ASCII art star charts, which is not necessarily very pretty. The point is, it does get the message across. You know, you know what you're looking at. The primary content of the book was numbers of tables, large reams of numbers, which does somewhat look like something from an accountancy spreadsheet. But this is possibly part of how people you know, do astronomy. It's a numerical science um, in, in its root. When we step onto the, onto the stage of graphic design, 1949 comes out as a winner. You can see that somebody, it says so in the minutes, but somebody with, a, with a, an artistic bent was, was asked to design a cover. And they used very cutting edge typography. They gave us this 49 one. Um, I think the chutzpah sort of died out, and by the 52s and the late mid 50s, they were back to a very standard, more formal, um, professional looking font. At this time, the Sky Guide was, um, or Sky Guide, sorry, the handbook was, was um, produced partially in Cape Town, because you have to make a physical book, it must be made somewhere. It was partially in Cape Town, and there was input from some folk in the then Transvaal. Um, especially Mr. Fenter, who did a great deal. And in, as we go into the next set of decades, the Transvaal Centers, uh, the Transvaal Centers branch of the computing section became the source of information. So the computing section, clever folks, I'll show you a picture of them just now. Um, they would do all the laborious calculations, and this would then be digested and presented in a nice format. So here we've got sort of the rainbow era of, of, of the handbook. 
um, large format, you'll see the size is different. And this was so that it could coincide with the size that Manasseh was. So the Manasseh editorial board was responsible for the handbook. And in 57, they changed the physical size to fit what the uh, uh, what Manasseh was, was doing. Uh, quite a large jump as we get into the 70s. Now UCT begins to play a role. Um, uh, the late Tody Farrell begins to play a role. Uh, remember, these manuscripts were typed on a, on a typewriter, which was then sort of cutting edge stuff for reproduction, at least. Um, so you're limited in choices to, to, to designs. We'll look in a moment what you can actually put inside such a book or what they did put inside. The trippy 70s, um, nicely beautiful, psychedelic. We get some interesting visuals for the first time on the cover. So that's a, uh, that's a lovely break. At the moment, these are still so, so one color drawings, um, line drawings, or however they were made. Not yet photographs, those had to wait for 1980. So in the good old 80s, the era of the big hair, there were now photographs on the cover. And as Chris Stewart was just saying, you know, we are a visual species, and I remember this was my first interaction. This is where my personal timeline crosses with, with Asa, is this uh, black and white cover um, with a comet. It's nice to have pictures on there on the on the you know we can have photos uh, uh, why not so this is where the, uh, the story for a few minutes is going to take a slightly personal bent so my line crossed with 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 Asa with that with that book and then skip a couple of rows down um, in 1994 I was doing uh, Manasseh and at that stage just prior to 94. Um, Joe Churns was doing, who's this gentleman here with a, with a, a sitting at his scope, um, Joe Churns, who was an astronomer in, in, at, in Cape Town, um, he was doing Manasseh and he was doing it the proper hardcore old school way, the little cut and paste way. If you, if you see how one makes a book in those days, that's where cut and paste comes from. We've got a knife and a ruler and some glue and somebody types up things and you cut them out and like some um, Erzatz jigsaw puzzle, you stick together an edition. So that meant everything that you wanted in the book had to be made camera ready and then cut and glued and stuck on a light box so that you got the thing square. And it was a whole performance just to produce a single issue. And that's true for Manasseh and the handbook. So um, I came along in 94 and said, well, why don't, <coughs> why don't we use computers? And they've just invented these electron things and we can now do desktop publishing. So let's move the Manasseh over to that. Um, it's quite quicker. And that's then what happened. And between 94 and 2003, I then also, instead of keeping quiet, I then also said, well, hang on a second. We've not been doing the Manasseh in a digital format. Why don't we do the, Sky the, the handbook in digital format? Because you've got the same benefits. It's easy and quick. And you don't cut your fingers off and you don't need glue. Glue is nice, but you don't need it. It was just more convenient. Um, that met with a little bit of resistance because you did require a certain skill set to do this. And in the late, in, in the early 2000s, um, the, the delightful Pat was, uh, Pat Booth was doing the, the, the handbook. And it literally, it took her her whole year to produce the thing. And we'll look now at what the contents looked like. Um, again, very actuarial. You had a, a very impressive looking tables of moonrise and moonset with you know various numbers and there were more numbers on this side. It was there were a lot of numbers in the book. It was a very technical looking um, document, and that was because it intended to serve a technical audience. And when I started discuss one day I walked into I'm, I'm, I should actually tell you the story. It's actually quite rude. Um, one day I, I, I was chatting with, with Pat and, and um, uh, Joe, and then I made a mention of how certain things in, this, in the handbook could be made a little bit prettier. And that was a very bad thing to say, because this particular feature, which you'll see in a minute, um, was something which they considered to be really pretty. And yeah, me coming in saying that, you know, we could do this uh, digitally better. So there was some uh, re reluctance to do this. At the same time, um, Asa was having problems with the distribution of the book. 
because they had to be put into into boxes and packets and then you know in the jam onto the moon and then the people had to send it to shops and what to do if they don't sell it and it was a whole problem and with the distribution and then and then late fortunately <clears throat> late in 2002 um matthew soltinsky came along and, and he, he applied his brilliance to suggesting <coughs> sorry he applied his brilliance to suggest that why don't we get somebody professional to take care of the distribution so matchy somewhere discovered pippa parker who's still with us and is still as lovely um who is a line editor at strike uh, which is the imprint of penguin random house something like that and matchy negotiated with her um to have the sky guy or the book the handbook published by ASA, but under the auspices of Strake, um, they would take a certain cut. We as a society would get what is our dues, one book per member, and anything over the top, you know, they could um, um, uh, they could sell. So that's then what happened. That kicked off. <coughs> that kicked off two and a half years of craziness, trying to come up with a new design. I know nothing about design. I can see when a thing has been designed. I don't know how to fix it. I got hold of Gerda van Seyl, who's a graphic designer, and she came up with a design for the book. We did a lot of back and forth and iteration. And that then led to the 2004 book, which looked so much different. There were icons inside and all sorts of pretty pictures, and it was in blue, and there was a full color cover. And it was completely um, a novel design. The title we can we can during tea we can talk about the title, but um, this is how this then set the trend for for what was to follow. In 2012, we had the first of two redesigns, which led to this approach. Um, so this again, um, all the hard work here was done by Strike, uh, by Colette Alves, and by Janice, who is a senior designer who um, really spent time and thought and made the typography more approachable. The content remained pretty much the same, or in fact, it remained the same. It was still very technical data, all particularly calculated for Southern Africa, but it didn't necessarily have a lot of public appeal, which is why the beautiful covers were chosen. <clears throat> the cover logic is, we don't we don't really get to choose the covers um the marketing people at at strike at penguin they go on some boss barat and then i don't know what they smoke or what they do <clears throat> but some inner spirit thing tells them this cover is going to be <clears throat> more saleable than that one <clears throat> so the actual cover choice is up to marketing then the second large redesign happened in, in 2022, which gives us the current book. And if you carefully compare the, the previous versions, I think you'll agree that this one um, is an improvement. This was a major redesign by Gillian Black, who is the current senior um, designer. And then <clears throat> since the title is the handbooks going in the future, this is what 2023 is going to look like. Again, I know you and I roll our eyes at seeing yet another picture of the Pleiades. Apparently, this is what the public is going to buy in droves. I don't know. The new design is far more open. It has removed all those technical tables that can sometimes be eye-watering to look at. Now, I know that's dangerous. This is a technical publication, but it must also cater for a casual stargazer. So um, in the new book, there will be a large splash photograph on every uh, page in the in the diary section in front. There'll be, or there are a lot more of these little diagrams, which apparently people find more useful. And this is an open call to anybody in the audience. Send me an email or a smoke signal and tell me what you don't like or what you think should be different. One can't cater to everybody. And that was the primary lesson that that came out of doing the doing the sky guide <clears throat> if one person writes in and complains that the table of moon times 
is missing or that there's no picture of the orbit of Jupiter or something. In the past, I bend over backwards to try to fit that in in the next edition. But we have limited space. That's one of the constraints is what do you put in? What is relevant to the most number of people? And I just realized that with this new redesign that we were losing certain opportunities by catering for one loud person who insists on seeing the star map of Mars's moons. So what we've done for 2023 is to remove all those actuarial tables, those long columns of numbers which nobody actually reads or one person reads, um, include more images, include more diagrams, make it look as if it is simpler, um, maintain the integrity of the calculations, those are still done using the, the gold standard ways of doing that, and then taking those tables of data which, which people's eyes gloss over and putting them on the ASA website as a free download so that you can sort of get a supplemental data thing um, on the ASA website which contains all these eye-watering numbers. So if you want to you know, print out all these things, then you can still do that. But the main book is, will hopefully, we will see, um, will hopefully be more um, approachable and digestible by the audience. That's about all I can say about, about the future. You know, the future time doesn't exist. It's an illusion. And if Putin doesn't change his behavior, there's going to be no future in any case. So I don't know what to say very much about the future um, other than some dreams. It would be great if it could be A4 size. It could be great if it could be in full color. Um, it would be great if we could have this in all languages. Um, a digital copy might be a thing to consider. One can currently buy it, 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 buy it digitally. Um, but so that's about all I would like to say about the digital version and that is available and is more convenient. Um, and then, yeah, that is essentially what I can think of sharing. Um, just to underline again, if anybody has any input, I, I would love to hear that, and definitely um, Ian Glass as well. Um, so, thank you. Thank you, Arka. Um, I think it's really cool, like what what has been achieved over the last twenty years, and um, I'm looking forward to next year as well, more than just a preview. And um, when is it out? Um, it should be in the shops in November. Okay, cool. So soon. Um, are there any questions here in the room? No problem. Can we not talk later? Yes. Um, yeah, so how, how can we uh, maybe get this uh, handbook? To quite a number of ends, like for instance, the, the science centers and uh, <clears throat> other, you know, where we, we try to make it much more you know, available. <clears throat> okay, did you hear that? Yes. Um, if I knew that question, I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd own a Lamborghini, I'd be super rich. It, it, it's essential. Science centers are a great idea. Game parks are a great idea. Um, personally, I think um, school libraries would be a great idea. Oh. I don't see why every town library shouldn't have one. Um, it's a cheap purchase for all years. Goods. How to do this? I don't know. Uh, that strikes marketing, I assume, should be driving that. But if you have any ideas, please, please tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, it's, at the moment, it's a it's a published book um, which belongs to Straight. Like we we edit it and we we produce it, but then they sell it. So you can buy it on Take a Lot. You can buy it at exclusive books or or anywhere. But it's a it's it's a book that they are selling. So it doesn't belong to us. Um, so one of the agreements we have is that as the members get one. Um, but we we essentially pay for that. Um, so 
I suppose the easiest way to do it is just to buy 10,000 of them, order 10,000 of them, and distribute them. Um, you know, if we did that through African Science Stars, you know, the, the December issue of African Science Stars comes with a free sky guide or something. Um, someone's going to have to pay for that, and there's only one person in this room who can. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but, um, yeah, you know, but, yeah, but, but it becomes a business. Yes, I think for me, I would like us to work out around something along those lines yeah. where we can get a certain number of copies. Yeah. Um, distribution as part of yeah. and, and outreach mm. engagement. So, so, yeah, so I think we can take it forward. And Daniel. Then I, Daniel, I have to interrupt. I have load shedding in less than one minute, and then my computer is going to be mucked. So I'm going to bid you all yeah. adieu. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Have a Thank good you. evening. And we, you might be back for the some of the discussion, but if you aren't, we can also chat. Uh, chat later. I'll let you know if there's anything that comes yeah. up. Thank right. you. Thanks again for the call. I think that was him. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to suggest that you. Think of it in connection with astrotourism as well, that would be yeah. pushed through those lines. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an incredible publication. And like, uh, like I said, it should be in game parts. And when you walk into the Kruger like, shop, gift shop, it should just be there. Um, but that comes from spirit marketing. Um, they have to believe that it's going to sell um, so that they make the effort to distribute it. Um, so whether so, I, and I, you know, selling a book, um, if, I, if I write a book, how do I get it in, in every shop in the country? Maybe we need to push them from a from our perspective to say, listen, you need to print 10,000 more than you're printing. Because I think at the moment they print 2,000. Um, and that's kind of all they can sell. Um, yeah. But if we if we say, you know, we're, we're going to buy 10,000 or we are going to, like, Try and put them in, in all these institutions, um, and you need to, to do a reprint. Then, then maybe they'll they'll see sort of the, the feedback. And I think that that is something you know. That when I when I brought up the idea of just having professional astronomers and just doubling the the ASA membership, that immediately doubles the requirement from Spread to publish the Sky Guide, uh, because at the moment half the, the sky guards are just going straight back to us. Um, they aren't selling publicly. And so how we, how we speak to the publisher and, and push marketing, um, we need to come to some agreement with them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think let's, let's discuss whether it's explore the economics. Yeah. And uh, see if maybe from our side, we can have some kind of yeah, and maybe through tourism. that we can say, okay, maybe we will support, we will buy a certain number of books. Yeah. Uh, maybe, but these are the terms of conditions. Uh, because obviously, from our side, it's more how we get this knowledge out to the public uh, through our various uh, outreach pro programs. So, yeah. So, cool. And then, um, and then, yeah, maybe we can. Um, Continue that discussion just this afternoon. Yeah, in the way forward. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know why Hassan doesn't say your membership fee to do the sky It does. Why do you have to? It does. Why do you have to pay any rand or? No, that's exactly what it does. Do. Yes, but I mean, it's more trouble than it's worth. You know, doing the EFT and all that. I should just say. It does. So, but you, I mean, you have to pay for your Hassan membership. Yeah, but why don't they include the sky in there? They do. They do. Well, Did you not get a free one? To pay for it. Cape Center, I have to pay for it. My email says you Cape Center chairs, yeah, is that correct? <laughs> okay, you, you can speak to Kristen. He's, he's, he's in charge, uh, but you should receive one. Or you're not paying, right. not paying it into the right account. <laughs> uh, Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's a pity that it. So it wasn't before OK had to disappear. I mean, the change from what its predecessor was to the Sky Guide was a 
like a step function. It's like orders of magnitude difference in, in the quality and appeal and comprehensiveness and ease of access and understanding. And so it's really hard to know what to do to improve it beyond that. And so I don't expect many um, suggestions in that regard. But as, as far as uh, uh, moving stuff onto a website is concerned, that's fine. Um, but it should persist for some years thereafter because people might want to go back to refer to a previous year's uh, information in that regard. But on the other hand, these days we've got busy planetarium programs that will go on our phone that will show us just about anything we want. So perhaps the need for that part is actually diminishing. So the, the battle to keep this thing relevant and to appeal to the public is real and ongoing. And we must all apply our minds and, and support the initiative as best we can. Thank you, Chris. Um, very good point and, and agreed. And I think maybe our next speaker is also Chris, uh, Chris de Koenig. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that and how and when he's going to be speaking about technology um, and how technology is influenced as and maybe how it will in the future 